Hi. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Tier 5 Workgroup Meeting to discuss concepts for useful life warranty, selective catalyst reduction, and inducement. Uh, this work group meeting will be recorded and uploaded to the CARB YouTube page a few days uh, after this meeting. Um, first, uh, we'd like to introduce Jenna Latt and Tim Heroy Rogalski to give some introductory remarks. Thanks, I can start. Good morning. Yes, I'm Kim Horogalski, Branch Chief here of the Mobile Source Reg Development Branch. And we're very excited today to share some um, pretty detailed concepts regarding inducements and useful life and warranty that would be part of our um, Tier 5 off-road diesel proposal. Um, and as always, um, the more questions and comments and feedback we get, um, the better chance we have of crafting a very successful proposal. So please do um, respond to us either in today's work group or if you prefer privately afterwards. Jenna? All right. Good morning, everyone. And um, thanks for joining us. I'm the manager of the off-road control section. Um, this is our fifth public meeting to discuss potential concepts for the tier five rulemaking. And we really appreciate your feedback and the meetings we've had with you individually and heard alternative concepts that that we've received to date. So since we've begun this, this rulemaking process more than two and a half years ago, we've, we've held over 100 meetings with stakeholders, believe it or not, and we've met and toured at, at five manufacturer facilities with, with EPA and listened to, to stakeholder feedback as well as met with EPA. Um, on our concepts too. So um, this is, is, is an important process for our team and your, your participation continues to make a difference in, in crafting our, our proposal. And we, we really appreciate the industry's collaboration with us most recently in providing CO2 child variant data that we've received and all the great discussions that, that we've had around CO2 around the CO2 tailpipe standard as an example. But for today's uh, work group, as Kim mentioned, we'll be talking about inducement, useful life, and warranty. And the two slide decks for our meeting are posted on our Tier 5 webpage, along with the agenda and, and the past presentations, if you want to look back at them. And as Christian's mentioned, this meeting's being recorded and, and will be posted. Um, so with that, I think we can just um, turn it over to, to Shun, who's our uh, first speaker. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Shun Nako. I'm a yeah, resources engineer um, in Mobile Source Regulatory Development Branch. So, Christian, can we get started? Next slide. Okay, um, so I'll start with background information and then present staff's thinking about defect investigation, reporting and corrective action concept, followed by useful life and warranty concept and wrap up by request for feedback. Next slide. So this is the background information of corrective, um, sorry, current investigation, reporting and corrective action requirements. The first step is defect investigation, uh, which is if the number of unscreened warranty claims indicate that a emission related component may have an issue, manufacturers must investigate to determine if the emission related component is defective by examining warranty claims, conducting in-use testing, reviewing consumer complaints, et cetera. The next step is defect report. Um, if the investigation shows that the, um, sorry, I'm seeing the different screen, sorry, thanks. Um, if the investigation shows that the emission related part is defective, manufacturers must submit the defect report, which contains information regarding the nature of the defect, how widespread the defect is, um, and how the defect will impact emissions and how the manufacturer will address the defect. And lastly, corrective action. The current regulatory text requires any emission related component of an engine family that has a failure rate exceeding 4% or 50 failures, whichever is greater um, shall be subject to recall. Unless the executive officer determines that a recall is unnecessary. And the current policy is to allow manufacturers to issue 
extended warranty um, instead of performing recalls for certain um, components. Next slide. So the previous slide uh, described the current requirements for corrective action. And this slide shows the tier five um, corrective action concept. The tier five concept codifies the policy, the current policy by identifying uh, which components would be subject to recall or extended warranties. And specifically recall would be required for failures of exhaust after treatment devices on board computers or systems, urea dosers and hydrocarbon injectors. For other components, extended warranties um, is required, would be required to full useful life. And the, and the executive officer has the flexibility to determine whether a recall is necessary um, consistent with the current regulation. Next slide. So this slide summarizes the current defect investigation, reporting and corrective action thresholds, as well as the tier five concept. And again, there are three steps, investigation, reporting and corrective action. And then thresholds for you know, less than 560 and then greater than 560 are different. And as you can see, thresholds are defined in absolute numbers or percentage, um, whichever is greater. Uh, which basically means that the small, I'm sorry, absolute numbers apply to engine families with small sales numbers, whereas the percentage numbers apply to engine families with large sales numbers. Um, so just to give an example, well, if you look at investigation threshold with um, less than 560 kilowatt, you know, the threshold is 50 or 10%, whichever is greater, then let's say the sales number is 100, for example, then 10% of 100 is 10, of course, so 50 or 10%, whichever is greater is um, 50, because 50 or 10, whichever is greater. Um, so now then that's the investigation threshold. Um, so this investigation threshold is defined in nationwide number and unscreened defect, meaning potential defect. And then the next step, defect reporting threshold is defined in nationwide number again, but but this time a screened defect, meaning confirmed defect. And lastly, corrective action threshold is based on California numbers and screened defect numbers. And in the tier five concept, uh, we plan to lower the absolute number threshold only. You know, that, that applies to small sales engine family and while keeping the percentage numbers the same. And next slide shows the rationale. So. Next slide, please. So here's the rationale. Um, so since tier five is likely to be California only program, at least initially, um, we think the absolute number of thresholds uh, need to be lowered to reflect the lower sales numbers in California to maintain the capability of identifying potential defects in most engine families. And next, the uh, corrective action thresholds with absolute number 50, um, we think need to be lowered because um, our analysis suggested nearly half of engine families would be effectively exempted without lowering the absolute number threshold because there are many engine families with sales number around 50 or less. Uh, we cannot show the detail of the analysis based on California sales number to protect confidential business information. Next slide. Moving on to the next topic, useful life. Um, so first of all, what is useful life? Um, manufacturers must certify that their engines will comply with applicable emission standards throughout the useful life. And the useful life of off-road engines greater than 37 kilowatt is 8,000 hours or 10 years, whichever comes first. In the November 2021 workshop, um, we asked for feedback for potentially extending the useful life to 12,000 hours. And we received various feedback and data, for example, low usage equipment, especially seasonal agriculture usage will not reach useful life hours and instead reach useful life year, years, number, year numbers. And equipment life can be shorter than engine's life. In that case, 
longer engine life doesn't like you know, extend the equipment life. And finally, longer useful life exacerbates the after treatment system packaging challenge. Next slide, please. So this is the background for emission warranty. So first, what is emission warranty? Manufacturers shall warrant to the purchaser that the engine is free from defects, which cause the failure of a warranted part to be identical in all material respects to, to the part as described in the engine manufacturer's application for certification. And the warranty period of off-road engines greater than 37 kilowatt is 3,000 hours or five years, whichever comes first. And manufacturers are required to track the information on possible defects and submit reports as I discussed, described earlier. Next slide, please. So this is our analysis of useful life. Um, new data from one of our contractors showed that the average life of engines in construction and agriculture sector is approximately 10,000 hours and 18 years which means in 10 years, average equipment only reaches around 5,600 hours, whereas useful life is 8,000 hours. In 15 years, average equipment fully utilizes 8,000 hour useful life. And again, longer useful life hours would not benefit seasonal operation with low usage equipment or short lived equipment with equipment life less than engines life. Therefore, uh, our plan is to maintain the current useful life hour limits, but extend the year limit by, 50, by about 50%. Next slide. Okay, moving on to warranty. Um, available data suggests uh, most of off-road equipment reach the year limit of warranty periods um, before reaching the hour limit. And uh, recent surveys um, to OEMs conducted by 44 Energy suggested that the cost impact of lengthening only the year limits in useful life and warranty would be small. Uh, therefore, our concept is to keep hours the same, but lengthen years by about 50% for both useful life and warranty and all power categories. And, and then the, the first time off-road onboard diagnostics and onboard monitoring requirement we are currently developing will encourage more owners to fix malfunctioning parts within warranty period. Next slide. Yeah, yeah. so this slide summarizes the, the current useful life warranty periods and then the tier five useful life warranty concept. So as you can see, there is no change in our limit and the number of years are increased by 50% and rounded up to the nearest integer uh, as shown in yellow highlight. Useful life will also apply to CARB's in-use compliance testing and manufacturer run in-use testing. Next slide. So lastly, um, um, we request feedback regarding everything, everything in this presentation, including potential thresholds for defect investigation, reporting, and corrective action thresholds, requirement for corrective action regarding uh, which components would be subject to be called extended mm -hmm. warranty, and of course, useful life and warranty periods. With that, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Shun. Uh, now we'll go into the question Q and A and discussion section uh, on useful life and warranty. Uh, some housekeeping. Uh, on this slide, we have the Zoom webinar details. Uh, uh, if you would like to call in instead, and and the access code uh, associated with that. Um, ways to ask questions is using the Q and A feature in Zoom. Uh, alternatively, you can use the raise hand feature if you want to give a, a verbal uh, comment or question. For those on the phone, you can press pound two to raise your hand and star six when asked to unmute. Uh, we ask that you please state your name and affiliation before you're ask, before asking a question or making a comment. 
Okay, uh, it looks like we have our first question in. Oh, can the link to the PowerPoint deck be provided to the audience? So yes, the PowerPoints are available on the tier five, uh, tier five rulemaking website, uh, the same webpage uh, available to be used to register for this. Uh, I'll try and uh, find a link and then provide it in the chat where, where you can get that. Uh, while I'm finding a link, uh, Stanitra Ario. Hi, this is Samitra from Toyota Material Handling. And their question is, onboard computers or systems, does this include anything other than the ECU? Oh yeah, we're referring to the ECU. You do. Uh, our next question comes from Brandon Kiss. Can you explain on the study indicating cost impact of extending warranty in useful life years would be a small or can this detail of the study be shared? Uh, Shun, Shun would like to answer this. Uh uh, yes, so the, the study is still in progress and then it is a con it is contracted by 44 Energy. So the final report will be made available when the study is completed, but it is based on survey to um, OEMs. Thanks, Shun. The next question is, hi, is warranty a new concept from tier four final? Uh, yeah, so I like to answer that. Um, it, it's not new, so it's been there, well, since the beginning of tier, um, and tier one. And yeah, so it's there. So the difference is that we're we're changing the this the um, the thresholds for reporting um, and using California sales. So that's that's one of the major changes. Thank you, Shun and Jenna. Our next question comes from Kevin Brown. What are the factors that are being reported as posing a packaging challenge for after treatment due to the extended useful life? Yeah, I'd like to take, take that. So the feedback we heard from industry is that uh, as the if the useful life hour is lengthened, um, for example, catalyst, I guess your catalyst has to be sized larger. Like you would need more, more amount of catalyst to withstand the longer durability, which can increase the size of SCR catalyst, which can create packaging challenging. So packaging challenge that so that's what we heard from manufacturers. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Rakesh Malorta. Is the determination that cost impact of increasing years is minimal based on California sales volumes or national sales volumes? No, I'll take that. It's um, it's based on California volume. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, Christian. I think um, mm -hmm. Tom Montez is having 
difficulty um, unmuting himself. So he he logged off and is logging back in, but just to keep an eye on out for him um, when he does, because I think he, he wanted to respond to some of the questions, but could not. I see, okay, I'll keep an eye for Tom. Thanks. One second, let me share these slides again. Well, we can take a pause here for, for more questions um, while we wait. And then um, we can also move on to the next topic. After that, I think we still are getting more questions. Okay. Here we Here's go. two more. We have a question from Rob Weiss. What is the current tier five status with EPA, uh, i.e. preemption? Hmm. Um, I can I can take that. Um, so with respect to tier five um, for for EPA, the tier five is currently not on their rulemaking agenda right now. Um, so but we are um, collaborating with them on our concepts and meet regularly. And um, they're they're also, you know, a, part a participant in our demonstration. So um, that's that's the situation with with EPA. I'm not sure what um, I guess that that would answer the preemption question because they would then be, um, you know, regulating preempted uh, engines. Thanks, Jana. The next question comes from Brandon Kiss. Will 44 Energy Study be public? Christian, before you go there, I just wanted to. Um add a little bit to what Jenna said. Oh, um, sorry. It, uh, no, my apologies for coming in late. The tier five rulemaking, it's a California rule only. So the warranty uh, extensions that Shun had described would only apply to California non-preempted equipment. Thank you, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, that previous question was, will the 44 energy study be public? I can take that one. Um, yes, that that will be public as part of our um, our Saria document um, next year. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, we have a question. Uh, when do you think this video recording will be public on public on Carbs Tier Five webpage? Uh, this video recording, it, it takes uh, approximately a week to get the recording on CARB's YouTube webpage, and then we will add a link to the, our Tier 5 webpage. Um, the next question is, how, how should engine manufacturers determine the California sales volume? Engine manufacturers have no visibility in engine sales within California once engines are sold to OEMs. I can try to take that. Um, so it's it's up to the manufacturer, but I, I understand sometimes it may be difficult or not feasible. So you know we are, we may consider some kind of estimate if it's based on a reasonable analysis. Thank you. We have a question from Steve Berry. Is Jenna's statement uh, regarding public availability for 44 Energy survey accurate? Uh, survey contains CBI. 
thanks for clarifying, Steve. Yeah, the survey will not be available. It's not even available to CARB. Um, I guess I was referencing the report. So thank you for clarifying that. Yes, the it's the report that that 44 provides to us that will be public, but the survey is not. Thanks, Jenna. The next question is from Brandon Kiss. Is defect reporting required each year? For example, do manufacturers need to submit a defect report stating there are no defects? And I think Adil would like to answer this question. Oh uh, yeah, no, they don't need to be submitted each year. Uh, the defect reports are just due once the uh, threshold has been exceeded, the reporting threshold. And uh, it's not necessary to submit a report uh, if there are no defects. Thanks, Adil. Is, um, well, we take a pause. Um, I think that Tom is still is back on, but having trouble unmuting himself. Um, do you happen to see him in the attendees list? I, I don't see Tom. Oh, here we here we are. Let okay. Uh, Tom, did you want to try to to speak to unmute yourself? Will we take a pause? And we have no questions. Okay, he's still having difficulty, Christian, for some reason. Yeah. It might be his own microphone. Yeah, I see here on Zoom, he's, at least in terms of Zoom, is unmuted. Maybe there's some hardware. I don't see any new questions yet. Okay, well, why don't we give it another minute and then we can um, queue up the next presentation by Muslim and okay. hopefully Tom can sort that out. Okay, uh, I'll transition to stop sharing and I think Muslim is going to share his slides. And while that's happening, Steve Berry has another question. Can you provide the rationale for reducing California only threshold from 50 slash 4% to 12 years and 4%? Or am I reading that right? Uh, yeah, so one big reason is that by, so we looked at the um, sales information provided by manufacturer for model year 2020. And there are, Simply, there are a lot of engine families with small sales number. So if we keep the threshold 50, um, a lot of engine family would be effectively exempted because the, if the sales is less than 50, then you would need more than 100% failure to reach the threshold. So which is why we felt it's necessary to lower um, 
how low can it be? Is, I mean, could be a, I mean, debatable, but uh, we, we felt 12 is significant improvement. Well, we, we, we thought it's feasible. So um, then we, if you have different analysis, we're happy to um, receive feedback. Thanks. Uh, if there's any questions, more questions on useful life and warranty, we'll, we'll have a general discussion uh, uh, after the inducement talk and inducement uh, discussion section. Uh, with that said, uh, I'll introduce uh, Muslim, who will be giving the presentation on SCR inducement. Thank you so much, Christian. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Muslim Hossein Mardi. I work for Jenna and I'm a resource engineer, part of tier five teams. And today I'm going over our concept, inducement concept for tier five rulemaking. To begin, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you attending this work group on the SCR inducement concept for tier five rulemaking. Uh, today, I will be covering the following topics. I'll provide a concise background for the SCR inducement concept and its underlying purpose. I'll delve into the specific details of SCR inducement concept that we are currently considering as part of tier five rulemaking. I'll discuss the types of engine that are covered by a CR inducement concept and its applicability. I'll talk about the inducement schedule, including activation phases and their respective timelines. I'll address the general criteria associated with a CR inducement concept, highlighting the key consideration. And lastly, I kindly request that each of you share your thoughts and comments on our proposed concepts, and we are open for more discussion about the concept and looking for your comments and feedbacks. So the current SCR inducement serves three main purposes. Firstly, it aims to ensure an adequate supply of diesel exhaust fluid, DEF. Secondly, it aims to promote the use of high quality DEF. And finally, it aims to discourage any tampering or unauthorized modification to the SCR system. These objectives are in place to ensure the effective emission control of the SCR system and to provide the operators with an incentive to address any issue that may hinder the proper operation of the SCR system, thereby reducing available torque. This is outlines the key objective of our tier five SCR inducement concept. We are clarifying how these specification are applied to off-road compression ignition engines. The current SCR inducement specification for off-road engine can be found in the EPA letter CD-14-10 HDNR dated May 12, 2014 and guidance from a collaborative public workshop conducted in July 2, 2010 by US EPA and CARB. Our primary objective in developing the tier five concept is to align with US EPA and provide clarity on a specification for off-road engine OEMs and ensuring consistency with operators in line with our alignment efforts with US EPA, we will uh, align them, we will codify the emergency override provision as outlined in 40 CFR 1039.665. We will also retain the three critical aspects of SCR inducement, which are DEF level, DEF quality, and tampering. This measure serves as essential means to encourage operators to uphold the proper functioning of a CR system. CARB is fully committed to upholding and promoting these core objectives. Currently, our focus is solely on inducement for SCR system. However, it's important to note that other emission control systems may have their own independent performance monitoring. 
This decision is driven by our primary objective of ensuring alignment with the US EPA. However, our stance on this matter may evolve over time as we are maintaining ongoing collaborative with US EPA and remain update on any regulatory changes or development. Model year, engine model year 2029 and later off-road compression ignition engine across all power categories that are electronically controlled and equipped with an SCR system are subject to SCR inducement measures. We are considering a comprehensive four element strategy to effectively address SCR related issues in our tier five concept. This strategy includes warning, initial inducement, severe inducement, and final inducement stages. In the warning stage, the driver will be alerted about a potential problem related to a CR system. This serves as an early indication to prompt necessary action and prevent further complication. If the issue persists, and remains on address within the specified condition or time frame, the initial inducement stage come into effect. During this stage, the engine maximum available torque will be reduced according to the predefined level outlined in the table. This reduction is designed to create a noticeable impact on the engine performance, serving as a strong incentive for the driver to promptly address the issue. In case where the problem continues to persist despite the initial inducement, the severe inducement stage is implemented. Here, the engine's maximum torque reduction is intensified, further limiting the engine's performance. This stage aims to exert greater pressure on the driver to take immediate action and rectify the SCR system problems. If all previous stage failed to bring about the necessary resolution, the final inducement stage is enacted. During this stage, the engine's maximum torque reduction reaches its maximum level, creating a significant impact on the engine's power output. Final inducement should provide enough advance warning to avoid unsafe condition and allow for diagnostic and restart after refill and mitigating the issue. Overall, this four element strategy enables us to effectively address SCR related issues while incentivizing drivers to promptly address and resolve any problem that may arise. When it comes to tampering, we acknowledge that achieving a system that is completely tamper proof is not feasible. However, manufacturers should diligently review all aspects of SCR design that might be susceptible to tampering and take appropriate measures to minimize the risk of circumvention. Note, this is no change from the current guidance. However, I want to emphasize that while we are considering the adaptation, uh, we are not considering the adaptation of NCD and PCD. We are, have ultimately decided not to proceed with either for the time being. So we were previously, we were considering adaptation NCD and PCD, but we further review that. We have ultimately decided not to proceed with either of those for time being. This slide highlights the key aspect of the general criteria for the SCR inducement concept that again are consistent with the current guidance. And let's explore each point in greater details. Self-healing, the system should possess the capability to automatically restart itself once the corrective action for the trigger event has been taken. This feature ensures that the system can recover and resume normal operation without external intervention. Generic scan tool restriction, the use of a generic scan tool to clear, induce, to clear inducement is not allowed, which represent no change to our existing policy. Instead, a specific factory or dealership tools are required for this purpose. 
This requirement ensures that proper diagnostic and maintenance procedures are followed, maximizing the effectiveness of the system. Repeat offense. If any second offense is detected within 40 hours of engine operation following the initial inducement, it will be considered a repeat offense. In such cases, the system will revert to final inducement within 60 minutes emphasizing the importance of timely resolution and preventing the prolonged non-compliance. Safe harbor triggers. The final inducement is triggered when two of the following events occur, refueling, parked idling, or engine restart. This mechanism is designed to ensure that the final inducement can be activated without posing any safety concern to the operator or the equipment to the, or the equipment. And practical example of how safe harbor condition can effectively minimize safety concerns and mitigate risk are actions such as raising the drill from a hole, lowering the bucket, and safety maneuvering equipment of a steep grades. Freeze protection. The system must demonstrate its ability to continue dosing reductant within 40 minutes, even in cold operating condition. This requirement guarantees that the SCR in the reductant remains unfrozen, enabling a CR system to operate effectively, regardless of environmental condition. It worth noting that 40 minutes is an optimal time. During certification evaluation, CAR will take into consideration the possibility of allowing an extended time window of up to 70 minutes if a manufacturer can provide a convincing demonstration of the need for additional time to ensure the complete functionality of the dosing system. Inducement engine derate fault codes and fault code associated with inducement or engine derate should be clearly displayed in a cabin or easily accessible using a generic scan tool. This facilitates straightforward identification and troubleshooting of the inducement related issues enabling swift action and resolution. And these criteria are designed to ensure proper operation of the SCR system, timely resolution of any issue that arise, and comp compliance with relevant regulation. And by adhering to these criteria, engine OEM can provide reliable and effective SCR system that meet emission standard and contribute to a cleaner and more sustainable environment. The purpose of this work group, as I mentioned earlier, is to provide clarity regarding the SCR inducement concept. We encourage your active participation for providing feedback and welcome your valuable input about our proposed concept. And again, we are just want to mention we are open to more discussion and your feedback for this concept. And uh, this last slide, this is Jenna's contact and my contact, and you are welcome to contact us about this concept and provide your feedback. Thank you for your attention and listening to my presentation. Thank you so much. I think we have one comment already in the Q&A. Yeah, this, co this comment comes from Sergio Catalan Vela. Do the torque reduction, do the torque reduction will apply also to diesel generators? A torque reduction may lead to a blackout on electrical services and may mean dangerous situations. I'm sorry, I hear a noise. Okay, go, go, go ahead. Answer. Yep. Yes, the torque reduction is also applied to the diesel generators, and uh, we are open to your feedback and look into this matter more. But in general, as I mentioned, this uh, SCR inducement concept applies to all the off road engines which are equipped with SCR systems. So if this uh, generator have SCR system, they are subject to the SCR inducement and torque reduction. Thank you. The next question comes from Greg Herner. 
Would these inducements impact marine engines? Uh, for time being, we are not considering the marine engine as part of land-based tier four, tier five rulemaking. Previously, the marine engine under 37 kilowatt was part of the tier four final, but for now we are not considering that. Jenna or Jeff, if you have more comment, please chime in. I think you answered it right, Muslim. Um, yeah. Propulsion less than uh, 50 horsepower, 37 kilowatts. We're part of tier four in California and we're part of uh, tiers one through three federally. We will not be looking uh, to extend that in tier five. So any inducement requirements that would apply under the tier five regulations would not apply to propulsion marine. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Muslim. Uh, we have another question from Brendan Kiss. Uh, what is the current thaw requirement for DEF? As I mentioned, the optimal uh, thaw requirement for DEF is 40 minutes, but currently it is uh, 70 minutes is acceptable. It's case to cases. So if you have a, a justification and uh, convincing reason for having more time up to 70 minutes uh, during the certification, they can consider that. Thanks, Mosul. Uh, another question from Brandon Kiss. Is EPA 70 minutes for a thought time? I believe yes, yeah. Uh, okay, it looks like we have a hand raised from Frank uh, Uh I'll allow you to talk. If you can uh, unmute yourself, you can ask your question or comment. Frank, you can unmute. There appears to be some technical difficulty. Uh, Mr. Frank, uh, while that gets sorted out, we can go to our next question from Rakesh Malorda. Final inducement or engine shutdown on empty tank can cause a safety issue. Has this been considered? Yes, that's why I was talking about the safe harbor condition and I'll also mentioned they should give enough warning in advance for final inducement. So that's the reason to have a safety harbor, safe harbor condition for final inducement. Thanks. Uh, our next question comes from Chad Gurgel. The 40 minute defreeze requirement is a shift from the current guidance 70 minutes. This doesn't constitute a carryover of the SCR inducement requirements from today. Changing this to request on, as, on an as needed basis or an optional target is still a change. Oh, I'm sorry, or an optimal target is still a change. So the 40 minute mentioned on the current guidance document already, and uh, we don't consider it as a change curve for now, but we are open for feedback. And uh, if they have more information about see, if what's causing the problem from 40 minute to 70 minute, we are open to discuss that for further about this defreezing, uh, defreezing time, but uh, has been mentioned in the guidance document previously. Thanks, Mosul. Our next question comes from Kristen Melville. 
Would there be any consideration for inducement overrides for equipment used in emergencies? Yes, that's the, when I mentioned 1039.665, that's the consideration for inducement override for equipment. That That's the rec for, we are aligning with US EPA and that use for this override equipment. Thank you. Uh, the next question, hello Muslim, would SCR tampering fall fall under the generic ECU tampering code when scanning using an OBT2 scanner? Mm -hmm. ECU tampering code. Could you say that one more time, Christian? Sure, sure I'll read the question. Would SCR tampering fault fall under a generic ECU tampering code when scanned using an OBD2 scanner? Okay. Is, is the question asking um, yeah, which fault code to use when tampering is detected? I think that's what they're asking if they're required to use a generic fault code when they detect tampering. So yeah, I think that's the way it's typically done today is the, the fault code would, would identify the area that is um, triggering the inducement and it would be a generic fault code. All right, next question. Sure, the next question comes from Mark Scott. For, for the thought testing, are you considering with a frozen urea tank? Are there any engine operating conditions that should be run while testing the thawing? Well, yes, uh, current guidance document has a test procedure for uh, this uh, untying the system and uh, we are not deviating from that. We are just uh, looking for feedback and if it's possible to reduce the time, but the current procedure is already there, how this, they have to untie the system using that test procedure. Okay, next question. Next question is from Benjamin, Benjamin Misru. How does the rulemaking apply to large diesel engines running HVO? Mm, well, the rule making, what is general question about the rule making or is about the SCR inducement? Can you clarify that one? Because as far as this SCR inducement, <clears throat> any diesel engine, as I mentioned on the presentation, within all power categories are equipped with the SCR system, they are subject to the CR inducement uh, concept. Yeah, maybe uh, Benjamin can uh, clarify further if necessary. Our next question comes from Ali Cruz. Uh, I was late to the presentation, my apologies. Will the PowerPoint be available to the attendees? Uh, where do I find it? Uh, I'll uh, type in an answer for the link to our Tier 5 webpage where the slides are available. We also mentioned uh, later this week or in a few days, this whole recorded uh, work group session will be available on CARB's YouTube site. Uh, our next question is, an operator would have no idea there is a problem until the warning is activated, at which, at which time they would also immediately be hit by 25% torque torque reduction. 
They could be in the middle of a high power operation of some kind and lose some of that power with no warning, which would create an unsafe condition. Is this really your intention? I don't believe the 25% torque direction causing that uh, kind of chaos because that's the that's the actually considered as an initial initial inducement or initial warning to the operator and uh, for as far as I know based on the guidance there are, should be enough warning and like audible chime for operator to know that the inducement is going to happen and can uh, react and respond to the warning before uh, to, to take action. And uh, anybody from CERT, if they have more comments, please go ahead. But 25% torque, I don't think that's like a very big uh, effect on the system, even the high power operations. This is Babak from certification. Yes. Um, they won't be hit immediately with 25%. They're going to get warning, and eventually the engine is going to ramp down by um, with, with a 25% torque reduction. Thank you, Babak. Thank you. Our next question comes from Linus Farias. What mass emissions reductions are expected from this rulemaking relative to tier four standards? Yeah, I can take that one. So tier four is, is a 0.4 grams per kilowatt hour standard. And for the um, 50, 56 to 560 range, we're considering a 90% reduction, which would be a 0 0.04 grams per kilowatt um, hour standard. Thank you, Jenna. Our next question comes from Jung Hoo Kim from Hyundai in InfraCore. For activation of inducement, the OLT OBD threshold limit should be decided to trigger the fault. How does CARB think about the threshold limit to trigger the fault like tampering? Would it be similar with on-road case or new? Tier five NOx emission limit is too low and the OBD threshold limit uh, should be considered to avoid misdiagnosis. I, yeah, this is Tom. Let me see if I can help with that one. I think as far as the, the tampering uh, threshold limits, that would be defined on the previous slide. Right, the was at slide six. So anytime one of those triggers are exceeded, that would, um, whether by tampering or whether by an actual fault, I think the thresholds would be the same. Can we flip to fly, slide six, please, Muslim? Yeah. Yeah, here. So, uh, yeah, my understanding is that whether it's, it's tampering or a real fault, th th these thresholds wouldn't change. So, um, the question seems to be asking if there's a, a difference. Yeah, we, we typically don't have a different uh, tampering threshold. All right, next question. Sure, the next question is from Algorajan Harukran. At what limit is the deaf quality detection considered? Yeah, I think we talked about that one previously, right? 
if I remember right, Jenna, the deaf quality uh, threshold is set at what the tier four final uh, NOx limit. That's right. Um, I, I mean, that's that's currently not in the guidance documents, but it's at, at 0.4 grams per kilowatt hour. We're looking for feedback on that. Um, typically, you know, we're looking to detect a loss in, in SCR efficiency. Yeah, I just want to chime in and add they have to maintain the minimum dev quality so they maintain the compliance. So if they don't keep the compliance, that means the dev quality is poor and they have to consider that one. Thank you. The next question is from Bruce Isef. Sorry. Will tier five require annual inspections and reporting such as the new clean truck act? So um, I'll take that right now. We are not contemplating a um, an inspection and reporting program um, similar to what we have as the the new clean truck. Um, I, I think I think you're referring to the heavy duty um, inspection and maintenance program, which has a new name, and I can't think of it at the off the top of my head. So I'll only talk about with respect to carbs programs. So the answer is no. Thanks. The next question is from Rakesh Malorta. Follow up to my previous question, final inducement is triggered only after two of the safe harbor triggers have occurred. Sorry. So this is a comment or this is... Sorry, uh, it's like a comment to his yeah. previous question, yeah. Yes, okay, yeah. Okay, the next, oh, this is uh, Benjamin also followed, uh, followed up on his previous question. Uh, he said it was a general question. Okay. Okay. The, the next question here is from Hu Zhang. Does it apply to SER systems installed on less than 56 kilowatts or if only for greater than 46 kilowatt SCR engines? All power categories with SCR system, they're subject to SCR inducement concept. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, another one from Jung Hoo Kim. Def quality tampering threshold is the same as emissions threshold. How about other tamperings like NOx sensor or SCR temperature sensor? Are these thresholds also the same emission limit? Yeah, Jen, I'm not sure if we have that those defined or if, um, is that clear in the, the previous EPA guidance? Muslim, did you want to take that one? Yeah, actually, tampering, we are generally are like a disconnecting the sensor or uh, deactivating the system. And that's generally means if you alter the system performance or you, so you are losing the loss of the catalyst efficiency that's considered as a tampering and uh, of course when you tamper with the system your emission limit is going to be higher than the standard and you should uh, be able to detect that and uh, induce the system so currently in our in our guidance documents there's um, descriptions of what's considering uh, what's considered tampering. So it's disconnecting the reductant level sensor, blocked reductant line or dosing valve, disconnected reductant dose valve, disconnected reductant pump, disconnected SCR wiring harness, um, disconnected a NOx sensor, and and there's a few others there. So that's that's how it's defined currently. So we're taking comments on if you think we need to um, include or exclude anything, please let us know. Thanks, Jenna. The next question comes from Eric Luke. Does the same inducement strategy apply to engines installed in equipment that runs autonomously, such as a generator, an emergency pump, or a TRU without an operator nearby?
Go ahead, Muslim. Sure, Sam. So SCR inducement are applied to generator. TRU is not part of the tier five rulemaking and uh, emergency pump, I believe they are under the emergency equipment. And uh, uh, I have, we have to look to it, into this, but I don't think emerge, if this uh, certified as an emergency equipment, they are, shouldn't be a, a subject to a SCR inducement. But we are going to look into this further. Yeah, I don't know if emergency pumps are included um, in that definition. So if you want to pro provide us feedback to to add that in, we, we'd certainly take that um, into consideration. Um, I don't know if uh, Frank, uh, who's uh, calling in, would like to unmute and ask his question. You may do so now. I'm not seeing any new questions. In the Q and A, so uh, if anyone has questions or comments, uh, feel free to be able to do so. Uh, there's also the raise hand feature. Okay, we have another question. Hi, is it really necessary to apply initial inducement already with 10% def left in the tank? The tailpipe emissions will not be affected until the tank is empty. So the purpose of the initial inducement is for the operator to take action in advance and doesn't wait up to the empty tank. So that's the main purpose. So you should always run on full tank or at least enough level of the depth in your tank. And these numbers we are putting here based on the guidance document, but we are open for the feedback and your comments on the level you seems appropriate. But as far as the initial inducement and the percentage is for doing the in advance, uh, rectifying the problem before reaching the critical situation. Our next question comes from John Rick. Can you clarify that there is an allowed ramp rate to the initial inducement of 25% torque reduction rather than immediately derating to that 25% upon activation of the initial inducement warning? That is what I heard from Vivek's comment. Yes, currently there is that option in the guidance document at and it is minimum 1% torque reduction per minute. So if you want to reduct doing the ramp reduction to 25% torque reduction, it can be done in 25 minutes. Apparently, we, we don't have any new qu new questions. We can wait a few more minutes. Um, and if you're not speaking, please mute yourself. I guess while we we take this pause, um. 
Oh, I see one did come in, but I will reiterate that if you want to have, if you, if you have specific comments on inducement, useful life or warranty, feel free to, or suggestions um, to make it a, a better program, or you have questions, you can always email us directly or email our, our tier five um, email address. It's, it's tier five at arb.ca.gov. We did get another question. Okay, this question comes from Mark Scott. What did the torque reduction based on con sorry, what did the torque reduction based on condition mean? I think he's referring to the asterisk at the bottom. Yes, it means the torque reduction based on condition. If you the purpose of this torque reduction is to get the attention of the operator to rectify the problem. So if the engine manufacturer thinks that the 40% that's enough to prevent the operator to do the job and they start to fixing the problem, that's fine. But if they need the, but if they can do this, they can still do their job with 40% and they don't bother to, if, to fixing the problem, they have to increase the torque reduction to 60%. So depend on the power of the engine and the type of the work they do. So the main goal is to get the attention of the operator to fix the problem. And this, we are calling it dependent on the condition. So that's the reason to, pre to stop the operator to do the job they're supposed to do. Thanks, we're still available for more questions. There's currently no questions in the queue. We have a question from Brandon Kiss. Has the proposed implementation timing of tier five changed? Is it published? If yes, where? If not published, when will it be? Yeah, I can take that question. Um, so the proposed implementation date is, is 2029. I believe that's in our SIP. Um, and it's also in the gov delivery that we just um, put out in order for you to to register for this work work group so that that I um, I think it's there um, and then we'll be actually releasing our our proposal for the entire tier five um, in late summer and so we'll have more detailed more details about um, implementation then. Uh, the next question from Brendan Kiss. Uh, please share the links to the SIP and Gov delivery if possible. Yep. So um, again, all our materials are, are uh, for our for our public meetings are available on our Tier Five website. So if you go to the car, I think Christians put the chat put in the chat the link. So you'll find um, access. There's a table in our uh, Tier Five. Um, section that lists all all the public meetings that we've had, all the past presentations, and then for each presentation, there's a what we call a gov government delivery, a gov delivery, and it announces a public workshop and it gives background. So it talks, it it states what we're going to be discussing in the public workshop, and then later on, it it gives a background on tier five. Um, on the SIP, if you go to the CARB website, um, just the main CARB website, and type in um, 2022 SIP, then you'll see, um, you'll be able to find that document. So I see another question. It's directed at me at Jenna. Is late summer 
Is the late summer release of the tier five requirements a draft rule or just a list of concepts? When is the draft rule expected? So the um, it's it's neither. So the late summer release is not a list of concepts because we've already provided a list of concepts in our first work group back in November um, 2021. So that was two over two years ago. Um, so the the work group that or the workshop that I'm referencing in late summer will be a complete. Um, description of of what we're proposing um, for tier five. So we've had, if you've participated in past workshops, we've or work group meetings, we've um, described concepts that we're considering, and then we've met with stakeholders one on one. We've also um, uh, met with EMA and and folks have provided us provided us with alternative concepts that we've considered and in some cases we're trying to to implement those suggestions so that's what the um the proposal will look like in late summer and then um in terms of a draft rule i think you're talking about i imagine you're talking about rule language and that would be um later on in the process i would i would i, I don't have timing on that but um i think it would likely be next year. I don't know, Jeff, if you want to chime in on this. Yeah, I was just going to say it'll be in 2024. Yep, which is next year. We're still open to more questions and comments. There's no current questions in the queue. All right. Well, it doesn't appear to, there don't appear, oh, here's one more. Um, our next question, is it possible to increase the time for reaching severe and final inducement? No service technician will be able to investigate or repair the engine within four hours. So, I believe when they started this guidance document, they considered the four hours final inducement and they come to conclusion that four hours to for final inducement is enough for off-road equipment because they can be fixed on site and you can call the technician but uh, we are open to your comments and feedback and if you have any reasoning behind to increase this but for now we are not uh, considering to lower the four hours for final inducements that's basically have for we are you know, consistent with the guidance document and we are keeping that one for now. Yep, so just to chime in, I, I agree yeah. with everything that Muslim just said. And if you have examples where the the four hour inducement is, is um, you know, provides a, an issue and you'd like to, or, you know, several examples, if you can provide those to us, we'd be, we'd be interested in, in listening to that and, and hearing those. So feel free to send us an email. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, when will the tier five final rule, uh, when is the tier five final rule expected? Yep, so that, that would be um, sometime next year in 2024. Thank you. Our next question comes from Rob Weiss. Please expand on the NCD slash PCD comment regarding not being adopted for now. It was a passing comment without any additional information. 
So NCD and PCD actually is kind of like a mini OBD concept for monitoring like uh, EGR and DPF. And currently we under tier five rulemaking, we are thinking of the OBM OBD concept and it's under development. And when I mentioned they are independently monitoring those uh, emission control system, I was referring to EGR and DPF and uh, that's uh, we are considering and we are working on that with OBD team. Jenna, if you have more to add, please. No, that, that sounds good, Muslim. Our next question comes from Andy Noble. When is the next workshop covering OBD planned? Well, I can I can take that one. I'm not sure if we have um, OBD folks who who are on the line um, that can answer, but I think right now we don't have a, a one planned. Um, but what what we do, I think what our our strategy is to include OBD in our in our late summer workshop. So we'll have more information on on um, the OBD concept during that workshop. And then, um, in addition to that, we I think the OBD folks have released their um, their concept at at an EMA meeting, um, and um, so so there was a lot of information provided at the the EMA uh, workshop. I think it was in May, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Steve confirmed that it was me. Um, Jenna, just to follow up on that OBD question, I thought we were waiting for um, EMA and manufacturers input on that May OBD um, proposal. Are we still waiting for, for more of that uh, feedback from the industry? on the OBD proposal? I mean, I don't think we're, it, it's in terms of waiting. Probably, you know, we're always open to to feedback from industry at all times, but we um we have to continue to proceed with the with the rulemaking. Mhm. Mm um, okay. I guess I, I I guess I thought we were expecting something more substantial from EMA or, or the other stakeholders. So yeah, Steve, if you uh, can chime in on that, if you have something uh, to, to share regarding the OBD proposal, that would be helpful. Ah, good. I, I put a note in the uh, Q and A, EMA has a meeting scheduled with the OBD team on tier five uh, on the 10th of July. So we have a three hour video conference scheduled where we'll give uh, a good bit of feedback on the concept shared and our own thoughts on the OBD. <clears throat> great. great, thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, that, I think that will help a lot to focus, you know, and bring the OBD proposal part to a, uh, you know, an endpoint. Good. Yep. Yeah. We're looking forward to it. Thank you, Steve.
I don't see any more questions in our Q&A or anyone's hands raised. Oh, we have a question here. Thanks for the presentations. Will will the warning be regulated? For example, dedicated lamp with color and behavior. So currently, we are following whatever is uh, identified and mentioned in the guidance document and. Uh, we are thinking to keep as it is for now, but we are open to feedback or comments regarding that from the industry and engine manufacturers. Yeah, I'm not seeing any new questions. Okay, just in response to that that question, also, um, we we don't tell manufacturers what learn what their warning light is besides just having a light. I think that's that's the the standard policy at least. So some manufacturers have beeping with light, or some just have a light. I still don't have any new questions or comments. Every time we try to conclude, <laughs> we get another question in. Yeah. So we can we can wait till 1030 and then sign off. And I guess I would just um, uh, just say that these proposals are pretty complex and technical. So if there's any parts that any of the audience like didn't quite absorb, like it's be totally, we'd be totally fine going over it again or, you know, explaining more what we meant. So please, no one be shy if there's something where you just didn't quite follow what the intent was. We, you know, we're here now, we have time to go over anything again. All right. Well, I'm not I'm not seeing any more questions or um, 
So uh, with that, I, I want to thank everybody for your attention today. Um, again, if you want to call us on the phone um, or you want to send us an email with suggestions, um, that would be terrific. We are planning, as I mentioned, to have our, our next workshop meeting in late summer. I don't have a date on that where we'll go over our full proposal and then we're going to be going to the board in June 2025. And then implementation should begin, you know, with implementation beginning in, in 2029. Um, so thanks again for, for attending. And this will be posted, the recording. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.